So um, I'm not going to leave too much more time. We're going to start the event now. So hopefully you can all see the slides. Um, the first topic for the Process Safety Forum is safety cases in unregulated environments. Every a week we're going to have a different topic and you're more than welcome to suggest topics so that we can have discussions on those. We've got about four topics already set and we're starting to sign up guests already. So we've signed up our first guest on this forum uh, for middle of October. So also if there's something that you're really passionate about and you want to share your knowledge about, please get in touch with the topic and let us know um, when you might be available to come on as a guest. So a quick agenda, we're going to be starting yep, about eight o'clock. We're gonna give a quick introduction to myself and Charlie and a quick introduction to the topic. And then about 10 past, we'll open the floor for questions. And as I mentioned before, just in case you've missed it, use the question mark when you type um, your message and that will flag it automatically for me as a question, which makes it much easier for us to answer them. And then about five minutes uh, before we wrap up, I'll be announcing the topic for next week. And um, and then we'll I'll give a little summary of the main things we've learned tonight. Okay, so a brief introduction. So Charlie, if you go first. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, Charlie Wilson. I've been doing process safety for the last 23 years already. And I'm a mechanical engineer and very focused on the human behavior side of process safety. Process safety management is my topic, solving or trying to help on the grades. And we've been involved all over at the moment in Canada, living around with different companies and different kind of facilities. And the idea is just to share experiences here and receive some feedback from you guys as well. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, Charlie, we're having a little bit of problem with your audio. I don't know if everybody is having that problem when I'm speaking. I can hear you very well. Okay, so maybe yeah, yeah. I just need to talk a little bit slower, Charlie, because it's breaking up okay. a little bit when you speak. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and then myself, um, so my name is Louise Whiting. I've been working in major operators for the last 11 years in process and process safety roles. Um, my main passion has always been safety, even when I was a process engineer, I wasn't really interested in the um, calculations part of it. Um, so, and also I've worked in a lot of different countries. So I've worked in the UK, the US, I've worked in India, Iraq, Dubai, um, and Norway, so um, a lot of different places, and I've had a lot of different experiences in both regulated and unregulated countries, which is why we chose this topic today, because I know a lot of you who may be listening may come from areas which are unregulated. So um, I wanted to just give a brief introduction about what a safety case is, and just for those who maybe are joining who don't know, so a safety case is a collection of all your process safety information. It contains the management commitment to process safety. It defines how we do process safety here, right? It can also cover, so just because it mainly covers process safety doesn't mean it can't also cover occupational health and safety, environment and quality, which could all be related to process safety topics. The general principles are, it's generally based on risk-based process safety management, right? So you generally don't make a safety case if you're on a compliance um, basis, but you, you build your safety case to demonstrate to yourself and maybe to a regulator or some external body that you have considered the risks associated with process safety on your facility and you are taking measures appropriate to the risk on your facility. It should be a working document that everybody uses all the time, right? If it sits on the shelf and nobody looks at it, you haven't written a very good safety case. 
Um, and it's really tricky to write a good safety case, but if you get a good safety case, it is a super useful document. It's the document that you can give to anybody who's coming to your facility to say, hey, this is an introduction to our facility. I have a process description. Um, it'll have your um, overall um, safety working system. It'll tell you where the permit to work is. It'll tell you has up everything. All of those things will be um, included in this one document. It doesn't contain everything. It's more like an index. So if you were thinking of going to the library and looking for everything on Napoleon, you could maybe go to a Napoleon section. You'll be able to see an index maybe with a summary of each book. That's a bit like what a safety case is. If you try and include all the information from all your studies in the safety case, you're going to have such a big document. Nobody will want to use it. Um, and it just it's, and it will just become too unwieldy. It kind of contains the summary and then the improvement plan. So as I said, yeah, it contains an improvement plan. That is one of the key aspects of your safety case. Doesn't matter how long you've been operating your facility, there's always things to improve. For example, you get some corrosion that's taken some time to happen. You need to improve that. You think you have two years to be able to affect the repair. That is part of your improvement plan and that will be documented in your safety case. And the reason it's good to document that in your safety case is it holds management to account. If you remember on the previous slide, I said that the safety case is where management put their commitment to process safety. And that means they are signing up to implement your improvement plan. So when you say we need to affect this repair and we need to have a shutdown and they go, oh, no, sorry, can't say, so, well, you know, you did sign the safety case. So that's a really good way of using the safety case to get things done, to make things better. And then you need to make sure that you update it when required. We can go into this in more detail, but sometimes uh, when you might need to update it is if you're having a major change to your facility. If you're changing the asset manager, you need to update the safety case. And that might not be um, that you change any of the content, but the, safe, the new asset manager needs to sign to say that he accepts the process safety risks as they are stated in the safety case, and he will operate the facility as such. And then another time you might update the safety case is once every five years. So as you go through your system, you will um, ha you'll have changes and there might be creeping changes. And so once every five years, you will revalidate your safety case. And again, we can go in into that in more detail if you guys are interested in that. Uh, asking the questions throughout the session. So that's all I have. Um, the, I see the first question we've had is from James. Um, and yes, the um, the, question, the slides will be available after the session if you want. I'll put them on LinkedIn as a document if you like. Okay. Um, the next question is, is there an ISO standard for safety cases? So as far as I know, Charlie, there's not one. Um, process safety no. is quite lean on ISO standards. However, a general sort of structure of, of a uh, safety case will meet the ISO standard for both quality management and um, environmental management. So ISO 14001 and ISO, I can never remember the other number, Charlie. Uh, the, the ISO 9000, 9, 9001, or yeah, then and we have the 45,000, yeah. 45, yeah. So those two ISO standards, the structure of those will help you meet the intent of a safety case structure. Yeah. Um, also, over the coming months, Charlie and I will be publishing a safety case template, which allows you to demonstrate the 20 elements according to the CCPS. Um, so if you keep a watch out for mine and Charlie's feed on LinkedIn, we'll let you know when that's available and maybe we can pilot it uh, with a couple of you guys if you are developing your safety case or updating. can let us know how it goes. CCPS, it's the um, Center for... Center of Chemical Process Safety. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys have seen this logo. So that's the CCPS. I'll give you guys um, a link to the CCPS uh, website. They post the bulletin, the beacon, isn't it, once a month, Charlie, where they give you some process safety tips. And they also yeah. provide some accreditation. 
Um, our next question, so we've answered this one. Um, the next question we have is, have you ever worked with risk-based process safety system launched by CCPS? So, um, Charlie, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, well, basically our training as well as our tool is 100% aligned with risk-based process safety approach from CCPS and the Energy Institute. And this is basically our framework to train people, yes. Yes, we work on, on that framework. Yeah. And so although I've um, started working with the CCPS framework uh, recently with Charlie, uh, the previous framework I, I used was the Shell framework, and I've also used the BP one. Both of them are very similar to the CCPS one, but they're not identical. And it is quite difficult to map from the sort of AIPSM or process safety framework within those organizations to how everything else happens, which is what has inspired us to develop this template for the safety case. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Will safety case be generated only by a PSM engineer or is it joint work between management and other disciplines? Charlie? <laughs> Well, basically, and there are different experiences depend, depending a lot on the company. However, it's a joint, let's say, participation. Always there is a lead or there is a, let's say, a racy chart where we show the different responsibilities and how we contribute. But it's a joint effort having a lead. It's like a small project, I would say. Yeah. So I've developed a safety case and although I did most of the work because I was the process safety engineer, it definitely needed the support of management and the support of operations and the other engineers. Because even some of the studies which support the safety case, for example, the cause and effects, the still study, the uh, PNIDs, those are all generated by other disciplines, not myself. And then also things like the risk-based uh, inspection or the RBI that is then generated by another discipline. So all of that information needs to be coming forward. And then we need the operating practices, et cetera. So that all needs to be sort of filtering into the action plan for the safety case. And if you try and generate it on your own, you're not gonna get a very useful document. Yeah. Okay, so we have another question. What is more practical and comprehensive? Is it CCPS risk-based process safety or OSHA PSM element to start with for a new organization? Uh, well, at that point, we have a very interesting paper and we did a comparison exactly because many people is asking these kind of questions. And one thing that we classify is flexibility and, and basically how, uh, how adaptable is the system. We believe that the RBPS from CCPS is something that we can apply anywhere in the world. Uh, because our expectations is not a mandatory law like OSHA. Uh, that's why sometimes we recommend on different countries out of US to have some sort of assessment first and then go for the system that will fit their needs because many countries, especially in emerging markets, people is copy and paste in OSHA and that is becoming some sort of problem because OSHA is a law in US, but it's not a law in other places and it's, having, it's quite prescript, prescriptive in some points. That's why uh, my recommendation on that point is what is more practical and comprehensive, I will go with a risk-based approach. Really. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think from building or using safety cases in a lot of different locations, I would always propose to use the risk-based process safety. Now, it's not easy. So um, yeah. I've always worked on facilities which use risk-based process safety, but I've seen safety cases which are constructed like um, compliance-based. So we, we've, installed, um, we've installed work orders for systems we haven't even installed on the facility because we think it's mandatory because of the framework. But, you know, there's no risk. We, we haven't identified it as a risk, so it's not built into our design. But yet, because we see that the corporate wants us to do this 
this activity, we've put these work orders in. And then when the guy goes to execute them, well, he's just closing them out because he knows that system doesn't actually exist. So yeah. um, making sure that when you go for risk-based process safety, you get some professional advice so that you can really understand the risks on your facility before you start building your foundation. Because that, that's really important to making sure it's a success, is really understanding what's happening where you are. So I have another question come in. How can I develop myself more in this field? Recent, recently completed NIBOSH PSM. So Charlie, do you know what's in the NIBOSH PSM? Uh, basically, NIBOSH is, um, is having an approach that is quite technical, I would say, like many universities at the moment, is if you want to keep developing, I would advise to go in a, in a more broad, let's say, management, process safety management point of view, instead just being so focused on, on technical matters because that's important, but at some point we need to understand the whole picture. And then the third step is gonna be always being exposed to, let's say process. I don't know exactly what what is your role at the moment, but yes, is a technical uh, review, then process safety management learning process, and then exposing yourself to apply what you learn during this academic let's say development yeah i mean what what i learned throughout my career is it doesn't matter how well i understand the topic if i cannot articulate that to the other people in the organization nobody's going to do the right thing yeah the the energy institute or ccps they have quite a lot of information as well and, and then you can build some sort of competence development program for yourself. But yes, you need, you need to cover some extra, let's say, to see the whole picture. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, as James has mentioned here, both the CCPS and the ICME have some really good training courses on sort of the fundamental processes and the technical parts. But as Charlie's mentioned, you do, you do need to um, sort of complement that with yeah. um, your with this sort of process, a softer approach so that you know actually how to implement these in the field and to make them work in practice. Right, so we have a question about what is the Energy Institute? So um, the Energy Institute is, a, is a, an organization, a non-for-profit organization um, based in Europe, um, a membership, you can get a membership with them. You can also be chartered through them, but they issue some key um, guidance or standard documents. For example, the Energy Institute issue the um, hazardous area classification document, which is widely used across the industry for placing electrical equipment or spark potential equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that and also they do a lot of um, they do a lot, a lot of seminars and, and that sort of thing, sharing knowledge uh, about the Energy Institute, uh, the energy sort of framework. They're trying to move not away from oil and gas, um, but the communications have been receiving from them. They're trying to look at a broader approach for the energy. So not only oil and gas anymore, but also including other elements of energy. So James has very kindly shared a couple of links for yeah. some publications. Um, another thing that I find really useful when I'm trying to develop myself is using the CSB videos. And in the CSB videos, they start to bring a, like um, a sharp realization about the difference between risk-based process safety and compliance-based process safety. So in many of the findings from the CSB, they've mentioned that OSHA haven't identified this as a risk. And so therefore mm -hmm. the facility didn't manage it. So you can start to see why risk base is much better where you identify your own risks and manage those proactively. Yeah. So we have another question here. There are too many companies, at least in emerging countries who say they understand PSM and can, can, can perform gap analysis and implementation. But in reality, they don't know much uh, than any other company how to assess company as nation in such nations. So how do we identify 
whether somebody is competent in process safety and whether they can do what they say they can do. Charlie, yeah. I know you're quite passionate about this. Well, basically this is exactly, you know, the drivers that we use to develop our program was exactly what you are mentioning. We have emerging countries or emerging markets where people is exposing occupational safety professionals to manage process safety aspects. We are having a gap in competence that is quite big. Then we have people that is retiring or they are close to retirement and they don't have any kind of uh, knowledge transfer process. And it's exactly what you're saying. That's why what we try to achieve with our program is to have a consistent way to identify the gaps and then have a consistent way to create a, an action plan because Really what is happening now, especially in emerging countries, and I will keep repeating that because I'm coming from South America and we are facing that problem, is that every consultant is bringing their own book. And that is just causing confusion and people don't understand, management doesn't understand, companies doesn't understand what process safety is, what are the requirements and what they're supposed to do. That's why how to assess such a, let's say, environment. Uh, that's why we create the tool, because we want to have just one approach for that gap analysis exercise. And that's why we consider the Energy Institute and the CCPS as part of that approach, just to be consistent and having just one picture on your gaps. Because otherwise, if you don't use a tool or something that is consi consistent, will depend always on who is doing the assessment, how they are doing it, and you will have different pictures for the same situation. That's why how to assess really is, is having a, a unified criteria at the beginning. That's why, and that, and that is a challenge, to be honest. It's, it's, it's becoming a challenge because there is nothing, at least in emerging markets that is there, there are just few countries that are having law for process safety. One is Peru. I think that is the only one so far. And, uh, and then there is no ISO standards. Most of things are copy and paste from OSHA, 19,000. 19, or in some cases, they try to adapt from different pieces and CCPS, OSHA, and things like that without understanding the process. That means uh, that's why it's one of our challenges at the moment, really. To, that, that is the main reason why we create our tool, because of this, just to avoid having different books for the same exercise. Yeah, so, um, sorry, I've just had a question about the tool, so I was just getting the link. Um, yeah, so also, I think, so I've purchased things uh, when I was working offshore, I was really fortunate that the people I was purchasing from were very competent. For example, we installed a heli deck system. As I went through the purchasing phase, I actually realized that when I started the purchasing program, I didn't know very much about um, purchasing a heli fuel system for an offshore platform. By the end, yeah. I knew quite a lot, but that was actually education by the people I was purchasing from. And fortunately, they'd already been selected by someone who was competent. And this was a way of teaching me how to understand how to purchase. But from that, I actually learned you have to be an intelligent purchaser, right? If you're trying to purchase process safety management um, a sort of skill set from someone, yeah. try to gain a little bit of information about what you're trying to purchase. So that's also the reason why we're, we're launching the Process Safety Channel and why we're having these sessions is because you can tell us what topic you want to know about. We can give you a couple of tips. You can use some of those questions. You can say, okay, well, you're going to do me a, a hazard. Which international standard are you going to use? Exactly. And they go, mm, there's not one issued. And you can go, well, no, actually, there is one issued, and this is the one I want you to use. Then you can start to realize what their competence might be in HAZOP. There are a lot of, for example, if you're doing a quantitative risk assessment, you could ask them what their base data would be. And again, we could provide you some guidance about 
where you might get different base data. And if they use one of those, then you could think that they may know what they're talking about. If they go, oh, well, you just tell me, then maybe you think oh, maybe that's not such a good company to go for. So um, there are some key questions you can use to try to understand if someone has some element of competence. It's not going to tell you everything. And most of the time, as I'm sure you guys are aware, you don't realize you've hired the wrong person until you've hired them and they're halfway through the job. Yeah. and they're not delivering but that's where charlie and i want to help out we're not going to give you advice on specific people or specific companies but we might be able to give you advice on topics that help you become a more intelligent buyer exactly um i'll get the link for the tool now so our next question is um can we share the link for the tool so i'll get that now um, if there's any more questions, please ask. I don't know, Charlie, you said you've um, applied safety cases in um, unregulated environments. Can you give us an example of where you've done that? Yeah, yeah that, that depends a lot on the company. In some countries in South America, because of the multinationals working there, they have as part of their standards a safety case requirement. And, and that was something new, really. People don't really understand. And I think that I want to mention this word, understanding, because the perception of, let's say, of a safety case when we explained that was, oh, no, more paperwork to do, more job to do. And nothing was related to, a, let's say, we are adding value or we are managing things in a different way or we are improving our overview of the risk and things like that. But yes, in South America or even in Africa or in some countries in Asia, the companies where uh, I was working for, they apply safety cases as part of their hazard management standard, but it's not a legal requirement in those countries. I'm talking about Nigeria, I'm talking about Indonesia, talking about Libya, talking about Algeria, uh, Peru, Argentina, uh, Mexico. There, there are different countries that the safety case was applied because of a requirement from the, the, the company itself. They, that, that was not something coming from the law. Yeah. All right, we've got another question in from Marcio. So this is about the safety case index. Can you share some of the items on the index? So I've worked um, with different formats for safety cases and um, some companies mandate what needs to be in the index and other companies give you some freedom. They tell you what things you need to talk about and then you can determine your own index. The things I've seen work really well is having an executive summary, having a process description, and um, that will be referencing where you could find your, um, for example, your PNIDs um, and all your operating procedures. So having a process description that gives you that. And then having something which describes your hazard management process. So how did you go about assessing your hazards? And what were the main hazards that you identified? And then the next one is how are you managing those risks? So in this section, I generally don't put too much information, but I reference some appendices. So for example, we may say that we have a permit to work system and it's based in X, Y, Z. For more details, see this document. And then we may say we um, do operational risk assessments and this is the format we use, see this document. So this sort of managing risk part might be a sort of index for how you do things. And then we've got the improvement plan, which I mentioned before, which is really key. So making sure that you identify the actions which are mitigating or preventing major accident hazards and which you need to implement to improve your situation. What I've often seen in the, in the action part is that people just, any action that they thought was a really good idea, they've stuck in this plan and then it gets focused on with, with a higher intensity. That's not the idea. It's also not the idea to replicate your HAZOP actions, et cetera, in, this action plan, these are specific actions to manage your major accident hazards if you have a problem. Some of your HAZOP actions may be escalated into this plan, but you're not going to be duplicating all your, your sort of study actions in here. 
Um, and then you have sort of um, a wrap up at the end just to say, you know, what the sort of main things that should happen in the next five years and when it's next going to be updated. You have a section which the management signed to say that they um, approve that this is how we should operate our asset. And then you have a lot of appendices. So you may issue mm -hmm. these as separate documents, but you may issue them as an appendix directly on your safety case. And those will be things like your bow ties. There'll be your hazards and effects register. You'll have your um, safety critical elements as a list. You'll have your safety critical tasks. Again, we can talk about any of these if anyone's interested. Um, so th that's kind of the gist of the safety case. And then what I saw work really well was taking the pertinent information from that and making a safety case booklet. So the booklet includes a little bit about the process and then it includes um, the maps so that you know where your escape routes are. It includes what the, the emergency evacuation sounds are so that you know when to evacuate. And that's the booklet that you give people when they arrive at site. So not only are they keeping safe from slip trips and falls, lifting, but they are also keeping safe from process safety. All right, so I'm going to put up the next question. In Brazil, many states have the requirement for licensing. We call this uh, as a law. Um, I can't see the question. Maybe it's on a different one. Let me see. No, I think, I, I, think that, I think that was more an aff uh, aff affirmation, but it's, uh, yeah, I think that I believe if I'm not wrong, um, a safety case is not part, it's part of many companies in Brazil, like the one that I was mentioning, that is a Spanish company or some companies like uh, a French company but there is no law in Brazil so far speaking about safety cases. These licensing requirements were more related to uh, environmental impact assessments, uh, some due diligence from a technical point of view, but I, I don't remember anything from asking for a safety case development or something similar. Yeah, maybe risk studies, yes. Okay, next is this one. I generated safety files for two of my projects, just providing document names and numbers to be used during the process, the pre-startup safety review. So, yeah, so the safety case is a little bit more than just providing the document names and numbers. Um, it it, it kind of summarizes. So, so, for example, you have a facility. It has 10 tanks. One tank has sodium hypochlorite in, the other one has um, sulfuric acid. One of the key things that you would communicate in your safety case is it's really bad news if you mix the two. And so therefore, to mitigate this, we have done A, B, and C. And if any of those fail, we're gonna have a massive toxic gas release and we will need to evacuate this area or we'll need to take this action. So those are the sort of, high level things that will be in your safety case. Um, you might not go into detail about how you're managing corrosion if that's not one of your key risks, but in other facilities that might be your biggest concern. For example, mm -hmm. if you have a lot of lagging and it's a hot, wet climate, you're gonna have a real big concern with external corrosion. If you have um, like a sour service, you're gonna have a sour wet service, you're gonna have a lot of problems with internal corrosion. So really the safety case has got to be aligned with what your key risks are in your facility. And then it will communicate what the key things are you do to manage those and where you might have identified some gaps and how you're going to close those. But it's a little bit more than just um, providing the list. It's like yeah. a map with some clues along the way. Risk analyses is always required in Brazil, but I agree it isn't safety case requirements. So that's just an update there. Okay, so yes. James has also provided some good documentation um, on process safety frameworks in developing countries. Um, can we do a meeting for discussion on various modeling softwares available for consequence and risk estimation? So yeah, we'll take that forward to a suggestion for the for yeah. another meeting. Yeah, that's a very interesting one. Yeah. So Charlie, when um, when you have seen a safety case working well. Um, 
what levels of the organization have generally been using it? Well, yeah, from a culture point of view, usually these organizations are between, if we, let's say, go through the letter and we go from pathological, reactive, uh, calculative, and then we go to proactive, usually our companies that are between calculative and proactive, they have a lot of standards and they understand that they have to do it not always using it 100 but those are the kind of companies that are a little bit developed in their culture they understand that they need to do this this kind of exercise uh, again coming back to emerging markets we are facing a big problem that we perform quite a high quality i would say safety cases or risk studies and things like that but then it's not used <laughs> it's it's something so, something that is sad at some point because technically is 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 done in a in a perfect manner is is high quality if you read it you will see that is is quite a lot of work there but it's not used for decision let's say process or the management doesn't understand completely what is the use and things like that and stays with the engineers. This is my, let's say, based on the kind of organizations that we are auditing is mainly the, the problem that we are facing. They have very good documentation, but they don't use it in the right way. Yeah, I'm, I've also seen that um, we have a really good framework, but yeah, if people don't see value in using the document, yeah. And also what I saw was when we built the safety case where we was working, we had really good information in it. And it wasn't until the manager read it and thought, yeah, no, this is really good. Then he started promoting it within the within the operators and then people actually started using it. So, yeah, um, yeah it does, as we said before on one of the earlier questions, it really requires that management buy-in to make sure that you've got um, you've got a good sort of backing. Yeah. One, one thing that we apply in some places and um, was working quite well is once we develop the safety cases, we have uh, a good, let's say, communication process on the both ties associated to the safety case. And that was like bringing most of the information in a very graphical view for from the safety case and people start understanding how it works and how they they how they play their part in each barrier and things like that that was working in some countries but anyways we keep facing the same problem that is depending on who is in the chair and who is directing the organization yeah okay so we've had another question come in is it important to update the safety case with change in operating envelope? What should be the frequency of reviewing the case again? So Charlie, I'll let you go first and then. Yeah, well, basically if we change the operating envelope, yes, we're supposed to reflect those changes because basically you are, you are well, usually you are, depends on how you are affecting your major hazards. Uh, I don't know what kind of change of it, but yes, the, the answer will be yes. If you do these kind of changes, you're supposed to review where the safety case was impacted. And in some companies, you have to go through a major change to update the safety case. In some other companies, you have a, a certain periods of every three years, every five years, every 10 years, that really is something that I found that depends a lot on, on, on the company that is using the safety case. Yeah, so what we did to manage, so um, if you're having a lot of uh, small changes, they can impact the, co the content of your safety case, but that might not be significant enough for you to um, update the whole case, right? Exactly. Um, so what we did was we issued safety case amendment notes um, or scans um, and basically you had the seven or eight sections of the safety case and you said well this change is going to impact the safety case and here here and here and so next time you update the safety case we collect all the scans together that have been raised 
and we just slot them into the the safety case document and make the changes because they've already been identified page number 54 needs to change this wording to this exactly. you know it's, it makes it really easy and then also the in the safety case when we uh, did the introduction we've said that the safety case needs to be read with the safety case amendment notes so yeah. at least everybody has the most up-to-date information but it's not obviously it's not kind of foolproof but um at least it you know because updating the safety case is a big job and you don't need to do that if the change is not very big um for example you might reduce the operating pressure on your facility but it might only be in one or two vessels and you might not need to change um you might need to do an assessment you might need to do a hazard and a LOPA study but you might not need to change the overall uh, safety case because it might be it might not even be one of your major accident hazards that you're impacting so yeah just really making sure you assess the level of change if it's changing a lot of sections of your safety case then you might need to reissue if you're building a new section to your plant like adding a a water facility to a, a, another part of your plant or changing the way in which you dry your instrument air then you probably will want to update your safety case but if you're doing minor changes uh, with your operating envelope you you probably be okay um a safety case will be developed by an epc or operations company well that depends again a lot on the company uh there are companies like shell for example where you start having some early preparations for safety cases during op operations and they start including things at the epc level but usually it's driven by operations is my my experience normally i don't know if you have a different experience Luis. So, yeah so but, um the experience i have so in shell they have two types of safety cases which are issued one is called the design safety case which is issued by the epc and that is provided as evidence to the operating part of the business that you have done a good design you've applied the standards you said you were going to apply um, these are how you've managed the risks etc so it's nothing to do with actually operating it doesn't tell you about your permit to work system and those sort of things it tells you about the actual design the things that you've put in place it might tell you what permit to to work system they've proposed to use on the facility but if you're not yet built your facility it's all it's all about proposals and then the operating manager has to accept that from the designers and say yeah no i think you guys have done a good job and um so now i'm going to take this information and i will build my operations um safety case and the operation safety case 80 percent of the information will be the same as the design one but there will be new elements which are not part of the design one. And it's it's like it, it, the reason they've separated is like taking ownership of the facility by the operations team. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'm taking your design. I'm going to operationalize. This is what I'm going to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, it can be tricky as well for people to, if they've worked mainly in design, to understand what the difference is between a design HSC case and um, an operations HSC case. Yeah, exactly yeah um and they're both equally important so um and the safety case is different at different phases of the design as well and it, it's completely different the content of the safety case um because it's achieving different objectives for example if you're in concept select you're providing evidence that the concepts that have been analyzed by the team have been analyzed in a robust way and the one which is driving risk lower has been selected if it hasn't been selected, then you're stating exactly the reasons why, right? The next phase, you're saying which standards you've selected to use, then that's handed over to the design team. They're then going to be saying which standards they have used, and then you've got the operations one. So it's kind of a way of managing your risks throughout the project. Um, but the one that's used mostly on site is the operational one. I'll publish the next question. Does a safety case update fall under the scope of management of change procedure can i can i ask a question here let's assume that the change the management of change procedure is a risk management tool now 
I think that the answer must come from you. If you need to, to manage that risk, you are changing one of the most important, let's say, documents or tools in your organization that is the safety case. You will go through a management of change process or not? Yeah. Because uh, because really it's more uh, and even even today we had a conversation about this same thing. Sometimes the perception is that management of change procedure is just that it's a procedure. But we are all the time doing management of change, and we are managing the risk. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's important. The answer will be yes. Uh, is is a management of change process? Yes. I mean, if you if you think about your document control process, that the way you change your documents and update it, that in itself is a um, a change control process. However, I agree with Charlie that this changing your safety case and updating your safety case is actually it's managing your risk. So it actually requires a lot more rigor than a normal document control. Yeah, um, and also during this process, you might identify new safety critical roles. Or tasks, exactly. or um, I don't know, you know, so you need to make sure that you follow on from that. You can't just issue the safety case and assume that everybody's going to know their responsibility. You then have yeah. to say, oh, I've issued the safety case. Next step along my thing is embedding it. So I need to operationalize it, communicate the new tasks to the people. If they've got tasks that are no longer required, tell them that's no longer required. And then closing the loop to say that you've documented those things. So there's a lot of things to happen when you update your safety case. Um, so yeah, definitely managing it in the management of change procedure is helpful. Yeah. Because otherwise you might miss things. And also, if you manage it through management of change, you get a multidisciplinary team to mm -hmm. look at the implementation of how you're going to implement it. So it's not just the process safety engineer going up, I'm updating my document, yay. Um, there's a yeah. lot of different people looking at it and they go, oh, but I need to know this and I need to know that and how am I going to get my guys to do this? And then you start coming up together with a plan for communication and update and attending workshops to support the update because there's a lot of work that needs to go into supporting the update. Yeah. Our next question is, uh, is it beneficial to prepare a separate commissioning case other than a design safety case and operational safety case? As sometimes commissioning risks are missed in the design case. What is your view in this context? Well, ah, oh, sorry. It's, um, you know, uh, the design safety case is including commissioning, mm -hmm. basically. It's, uh, is uh, there are certain things, for example, one one good strategy that I've seen from companies like Shell or or BP or other companies like that is that uh, during the design safety case, they always bring what they call ICOT, that is the integrated commissioning and operation team as part of that development, just to have that early involvement of people doing all these phases, especially from operations. That's why, uh, yeah, the design safety case is including commissioning. There is no no a separate one, but there are people from operations as part of that. Let's say those aspects. Yeah. Usually, yeah, and I think I think that sometimes the design engineers can. I think where you might be coming from is the design engineers can be taking a different sort of Absolutely. lens to commissioning. Mm -hmm. Their lens for commissioning is making sure that the commissioning tasks to prove the safety critical elements will operate, it ha happens. They don't think necessarily about, well, what are the risks of doing these tasks? You know, yeah. like, because there are risks associated with doing these tasks. They don't, because you're in commissioning phase, things don't always go according to plan. You might have to break containment to, bleed out some fluid from a level transmitter, all of these sort of temporary things that happen. Maybe you need to override some equipment while you test some other part of the system. These sort of things need to be considered in, for example, you could use um, like a, a commissioning or construction hazard, hazard identification, or you could use a sort of light touch HAZOP 
to just think about the stages okay i'm going to commission the the boiler i need to do this and this and this and this well what if i do this and before i do this one or you could use like a procedural has up to think about if you did things out of sequence so it is something that you need to think about and i think often when you're coming you're like you're racing towards commissioning the the deadline for commissioning is racing towards you and you kind of suddenly realize you've got this big bit of work you haven't even thought about which is your actual commissioning risks and um sometimes it, well just the commissioning team will figure it out well no you need to have a little bit of time together to think these things through and making that time is really important as well as issuing all the documents ready for operations yeah um, so we have probably time for one more question if anybody has any burning questions on the line and then we'll just do a wrap up of what we've discussed today. Mm -hmm. We've got I a think... couple of good suggestions for topics so we'll take those into um, consideration when we draw up our topics for the next sessions. Yeah, before we go to the wrap up, uh, we I, I want to thank James. Uh, he's been sharing very quite useful information. Thanks, thank, thanks a lot, James. Yeah, and so the video will be available on YouTube. And what I'll do is I'll copy all the links that James has shared and any links that we've shared, and um, and then we'll we'll put those in the comments for the YouTube video. So we've got one last question. Does ASP or CSP talk about safety case? Charlie, you'll have to take this because I have no idea what these acronyms mean. Yeah, I was coming to that. What can you explain me? What you, uh, what is ASIP and CSP? Because I believe that I understand that, but I want to be sure. Uh, because uh, just to be sure, if you can clarify the meaning of those acronyms, well. This is something that, you know, one thing that I'm taking from this uh, first process safety forum is sometimes we assume that people understand what we are saying. Especially, if, for example, we start saying CCPS like something that is normal in our process safety world. But not, not everybody, everybody knows about CCPS. And I, I'm taking that as a lesson learned because sometimes we assume that everybody understand yeah thanks james we look forward to having you on the future ones what did you see that uh, there is uh, one more there yeah so uh paris paris to i hope i've pronounced your name correctly if you can give us the details of those oh here we go i'll publish this one first and then we'll go to that other question associate safety professional and safety oh, okay. professional certified yeah. No, no, there is no particular, they, there is no mention there about safety case requirements or structures or how to develop, no. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the thing to remember is safety cases are mandated in a, only a handful of countries. Um, however, having worked in oil majors where we use safety cases, I found I find it is an incredibly useful document for managing process safety and bringing everything together, which is why we've we've brought this here. And we've used both Charlie and I've used it in countries where it hasn't been regulated and it was useful. Yeah. So the last question, and then we'll just wrap up. What HSC documents are required before starting commissioning of a new used oil refinery? Oof. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> how, do, how long do you have? <laughs> The, those uh, the, that is a very challenging question. Uh, the answer can be a lot. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's it's a long list of uh, requirements. Well, maybe at least the the key ones, but HSC documents. Mm. I mean, yeah, it's a, I don't I don't want to answer partially or something really. I don't want to direct you in, in the wrong way. We have that list anyways. It's, it's something that we can uh, share the good practices on this. But uh, yeah, there are many documents there. Depends on the company as well. Yeah. I mean, the main thing, Otam, is to think about what risks you're managing. 
Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I was. I... Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about loss of containment risks, you need to be thinking about, well, how can I get loss of containment? If I can get it from overpressure, then there'll be key documents associated with how I designed my, my vessels, which codes are used, how I tested them to make sure they're not going to fail in service. And then and I'm thinking, okay, if overpressure is a potential, I might then be thinking about my relief valves and then certificates to say they were built correctly, they, was, they were sized. But there is loads of documents and it really is what risks are on your facility and then how you've managed those. And those are the documents which are important for you. Yeah, one last comment about this is another thing that is important to consider is that in many cases, the HEC document speak about the framework but when you talk about commissioning, there are many things that are not in those documents. That's why it's, uh, yeah, I think that risk-based will be the best, yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you to everyone who's attended. We have the last um, few minutes now before we close. So next week, we're going to be talking about temporary changes. Um, management of change is something I'm really passionate about because um, everybody thinks they know what management of change is and uh, most of the time they don't actually know what management of change is. They don't know how to identify a change. Um, how do you know if change is a temporary change or a permanent change? And sometimes temporary changes merge into permanent change over time. And so that's what we want to talk about next time. Temporary changes, when is it a temporary change? How do you know it's a temporary change? What sh what different things should I do? Is it how is a temporary change different from a permanent change? What does closure of a temporary change mean? Those sort of things we'll discuss next time. And welcome all your questions and to share your good practices from where you are working. Um, so please come along next time. And thank you so much for attending this time. I've really enjoyed the questions that you guys have shared. Charlie, thank you very much, all, and really that that was a pleasure to to share this kind of uh, forum. Thank you, Luis, for organizing this as well. Oh, thank you. So I'm just gonna, um, so I've seen quite a few thank yous on the list and some uh, topics. I'm gonna just share a quick um, survey now. If you have time, fill it out. There's an option for you to give us some topics. We'll be able to download that in a spreadsheet so that we can, so that we can start building the, um, the content for the coming weeks and letting you know what's coming. Okay, yeah. um, so now if I just figure out which button to press, there we go. Perfect. So hopefully you should all, be, this is the first time I'm using this myself, so you should all be able to answer them. Yeah. Perfect. And while you are answering the questions, please don't, uh, don't hesitate to share uh, invitation to anyone that's interested in process safety or coming to our forum. The idea is to share experiences and be all together here. Yeah. I mean, the idea is that there's a lot of people who are working maybe in isolation in a company. They're the only process safety engineer on that facility, or maybe they've suddenly been given process safety responsibility. They don't have anybody to turn to. So bring them here and we can all discuss and learn together. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave that open until five past eight. I'm, I'm going to say goodbye on the video now. So thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Take care.